Welcome back to Cornerstone's Walking with God equipping class. I am Scott, and with me is Brian. Hello. Our instructor again, and Matt. Hey. Our contributor. What we're doing in this class, again, is teaching you how to live the basic Christian life. This class is built around the discipleship pathway, and this is our seventh session overall and our third session exploring the prayer category, speaking to and relating to God. So we're not going to recap what we've covered in all seven sessions, but just in this prayer category, Brian, can you give us a a brief recap of of where we've been? The first class, we talked about biblical meditation, which uh, most people don't think about in terms of prayer, but really we saw was a bridge between Bible reading and prayer that allows you to internalize what God's saying in a deep way and then leads you to speak and relate to him uh, in response. And then in our second class. Yeah, the second class we uh, just finished uh, discussing what the pr- what the process of prayer actually is. We talked about the Lord's Prayer and what Jesus kind of commands us in prayer, but then we also talked about the different kinds of prayer and different ways of approaching God depending on circumstance and life and other things. We talked about adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication, and lament as the different kinds of prayer that can be manifested in our prayer life and our relationship with God. All right, and so in this third session, we're going to look at some of the practicalities of prayer, maybe, maybe more specifically some of the practicalities of, of our time in prayer. Um, Brian, what are some of the practical obstacles that get in the way of people's prayer lives? I hear people talk about this all the time, I think. Um, and what we're talking about basically is like a devotional time. So a time of, of reading your Bible, of meditating, of praying, Um, And there's a lot of struggles people have uh, practically with that. The number one thing I hear, and I think we all hear, is I just don't feel like I have time. I feel like I'm too busy. But there's also uh, other issues kind of underneath that one, you know, where uh, there's an issue people face about scheduling it. Like, is that too mechanical? Is that too rote? You know, is it okay to schedule this sort of time? Uh, when they read or open their Bible or want to meditate, it's easy to be overwhelmed. It's a big book. You know, where do you start? What do you choose to read? And then when you go to pray, you can be overwhelmed with all the different things you could pray about and sort of feel stuck. Or uh, a lot of people, they pray for everything they can think of and then realize it's been like five minutes and they don't know what to do with that. And so uh, while I think for a lot of Christians, um, if you're in a crisis, a lot of times Bible and prayer come naturally to you. But most of us live our lives outside of crisis. We're not thrown towards God in that way. And so outside of those crisis times, we kind of wonder, how do you actually do this? What, how do you practice this in a sustainable, consistent kind of way? All right. So, and that's what we're going to deal with in this session, right? How do you practically develop a prayer life? And so we're going to talk about first where to put prayer in your schedule, um, number two, uh, how to handle your expectations, and third, how to figure out what to do when you're praying. So let's start by talking about making time for prayer. Um, but as we actually, maybe before we jump into how we make time for prayer, we first have to figure out the assumptions we have to be making. So, so let's start with this. Matt, how often should you pray? Four times a day. <laughs> Four times a day. Yeah. Okay. Uh, before meals and then another time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, uh, so it's interesting because the Bible talks about frequency in prayer in a variety of different ways. Uh, for example, we are commanded in the New Testament to pray without ceasing, which is something that we're going to talk about more in our, our next session. Um, and then on the other hand, there's not really a specific biblical command to have a quiet time every single day. And so the question kind of comes up, so what do you what do you do? What are we supposed to do? What's the expectation? Should we set aside time to pray or should we just be praying all the time and call it good? Um, but uh, I think there's also a reality of the fact that there's historical examples and biblical examples of people that we see, godly um, godly men and women who pray regularly. David, for example, and Daniel both prayed three times a day. Um, many times Psalms speak about praying evening and morning, um, and so that we might spend the beginning and the end of the day with God. Jesus talks about praying for our daily bread, so that implies daily, praying for your daily bread. 
Um, and, and so I think there's an interesting kind of sense of frequency. But one of the reasons is that the Bible doesn't really give a magic number of prayers per week or prayers per day is that uh, the Bible doesn't view prayer as like some religious duty that you just have to check off and then move on to the next things of life. Um, it's not really a question to ask, how often do I have to pray? That implies a sense of like duty to it and loses the relational side. Um, so to uh, prayer in the Bible is kind of set aside time for communion with God, who is our Lord and our loving Father. And so our relationship with God calls us basically what the Bible would say is that we should prioritize prayer in our life. And that might express itself differently in different seasons of life, but it must be, it has to be a priority because of our relationship with God um, at the very least. All right. So an answer and not an answer. All wrapped into one. Yeah, an answer and a, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm trying I mean, to get I mean, a broad. No, no, I, and, and I think I think, actually I think that's really helpful because I think the question we have is how often we should pray, but I think oftentimes behind that lies some of these assumptions, and I think what you're saying about the the priority of prayer and the regularity of prayer, um, in one sense, lends itself to to some of that, but um, at the same time, um, it. it it doesn't lead us to a arbitrary kind of specific number of times a day. Right, so, a so, task list yeah. to check off. So, 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 so let me let me ask a, a another similarly <laughs> specific question that maybe doesn't have a neat answer, but is also a, but is an is a question that a lot of us have. I know I have and, and wrestle with, but it, which is okay. How long should we pray? Yeah, it's very it's a very similar answer. I mean, I think there in the Bible you have no recorded min and count of like any Bible reading or prayer times, you know, prayers that are recorded in the Bible range from a few words to like multiple paragraphs. Uh, Jesus and the apostles would spend all night in prayer. So you have this range of, of, um, of length when it comes to prayer and uh, listening to God and speaking to God. But what the Bible does give you is these two extremes in prayer. And so on, on, on the one side, you have this extreme the prayers that are long in time, but short in content. And we talked about that in our last session where Jesus talks about the heaping up of empty phrases. So like, like a long-winded prayer isn't necessarily more holy than a short prayer. You don't want to like, you're not, you're not running out the clock when you pray. And the Bible says, be careful, don't, don't do insincere long prayers. Um, but on the other extreme, there are prayers that are short and insincere. I know Don Carson once compared some, some of our prayer lives to like, like ringing a doorbell and running away. <laughs> like, like by the time someone's there to like ex- interact with you, you're gone. And, and ding dong ditching. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And the Puritans would talk about this. They had this phrase like "pray the, until the you pray." The Puritans talked about ding dong ditching. Yes, <laughs> yes. It, it was, was actual it. bells, though. It was like yeah. real bells. They rang a very large bell and then they ran. Yeah, but they ran it very uh, slowly. I, I cannot imagine them ever doing that. Um, but I can imagine them talking about prayer a lot <laughs> instead of doing that, which they did. Yeah. And they had this phrase, you know, "pray until you pray." which is sort of we're looking to engage God in our prayers. And some, that, sometimes that, that requires getting past some formalism, getting past some hardness of heart that you encounter in the first few minutes of sitting down. And so kind of like Matt said, there's a good reason we don't have like a minute count in the Bible because it just instead of, of giving us sort of this rote amount we're supposed to clock in and clock out of every day, we have these extremes we want to avoid. And so the answer for this is typically like a range, like somewhere between X and Y minutes is usually for me what it will take to know that I am engaging with God, but also not necessarily heaping up phrases just just to fill time. Like X and a half minutes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so if, if there's not a specific number of times a day we should pray, and if there's not a specific number of minutes we should pray every time we pray, then, I mean... The, I think that's that's helpful in one sense because it helps us remember that this is a relationship and that it's organic and that it's uh, ongoing and that it takes all sorts of different forms. Um, but when we talk about our practical times of prayer or setting aside time to pray, um, like, is that even something we should do then? Like, sh- should we schedule time to pray? Yeah, I think absolutely we should do that um, because the reason why it's important to talk about the assumptions we have in terms of uh, quantity, uh, consistency, or uh, the amount you know per day of prayer or the, the minute count, the reason that's important is because I think everyone who's become a Christian has some assumption of what the holy amount and number is. 
And that might not correspond to the Bible. It might not be scalable around different seasons of your life. And so you have to sort of deconstruct some of the assumptions you've gotten over time before you're able to then look uh, uh, to Scripture and look to your life and begin to schedule prayer. Usually it's just more. Yes, like, exactly. It's just like the, the amount of time is just more. Like that's I just more and however much is happening now, just more than that. Yeah. Well, there's always a floor. It's like some people are like, it's, it's 30 minutes. I don't know why. It just is. And if I go below 30 minutes, I'm a sinner. And if I go above 30 minutes, I'm like in the black. And that's not what we want to do with our relationship with God. But the thing is, anytime you prioritize a relationship, you make time for that relationship. You do some kind of scheduling. I know for a lot of people that can make, with prayer, that can make it sound dry and boring. You know, the idea is sort of, we shouldn't have to schedule, you know, such an intimate and joyful relationship. But for anyone living in reality with any real relationship, you know that's not true. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I remember being so surprised by, when I was single... I was so surprised by the married couple date night. I was like, your whole life is a date night. Like, what? why do you need to have a date night? Like, And I just was so blown away by that. I thought it was the dumbest thing I'd ever heard. But then I thought about me and my roommates who were really close friends and now we're roommates. And I was like, I actually have to schedule time with them, even though we live with each other, to maintain the friendship. And so anything you value, any person that you want to have a deep relationship with, you have to schedule that time. You have to uh, allow for quantity time in order to have quality time with that person. And so the only pathway to that is some kind of consistency, is, is making it enough of a priority to you that you say, I'm planning to engage with you, to get time with you at, at, on this day at this time. Okay, so, so, so do you have any practical tips to kind of help guide us in that way? Like, should, should we should we schedule a date night with God? Uh, where, you know, where, where, where do we go from there? Please don't call it that. No, no, that is that is no, not good. I'm going um, to call it that from now on. <laughs> no more quiet time. Please don't. I'm having my date night. Oh, my goodness. We would be that weird church. Are we, um, are we recording this? <laughs> so tips for scheduling prayer. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, a lot of people, what they do is they tend to just sort of go, well, I'm going to... I'm going to schedule my prayer life, and it's sort of this all or nothing kind of thing. And so what I've found helpful for myself and for other people, I've got these four sort of tips. One, be realistic. Like, if you're never up before 9 a.m., like, don't say, I'm going to schedule prayer at 6 a.m. every morning. Like, that's just a bad idea. Like, don't start there. <laughs> you can work your way to there if you want, but that's not realistic. And we tend to do that. Like, I'm going to get really holy. Well, no, you need to put it in your real life. So be realistic. You've got to give yourself room. That's the second one. Like uh, some people, they'll say, I want to pray for however many minutes they pick. And they schedule, the, I'm going to pray for 30 minutes. And they schedule a 30-minute block. And I'm going to do that. And before I've got to take a shower and after I've got to leave for work, or I'm going to be late. And you need to give yourself a little more room than that. Because that if you do it that way, uh, and then any small thing goes wrong, you sleep in an extra five minutes or you know uh, uh, something takes too long, uh, all of a sudden you're like out of time. So, so you want to give yourself a little room in the schedule. Okay, so explain that just a little bit further. So, like, like you need to give yourself more room than 30 minutes? Right, no. You, yeah, you need to give yourself a buffer around whatever time you're going to schedule. There we go. Yeah, okay. that's more helpful. Yeah, yeah. And so you want that buffer there in case something unforeseen happens so that you have that margin to still be able to have the time that you, you want it to have. Got it. So, so, so even if you're hoping to have 30 minutes, mm -hmm. you're, you're just generally scheduling yeah. in margin um, so that, if something goes wrong, prayer isn't the thing that always gets eaten. Which is the problem, yeah, right? Is right, the minute something yeah. goes wrong, that's the thing that drops. And so if you want 30s, maybe schedule 40 or 45, you know, in however you keep your calendar. Um, so that's one. Uh, the third one is give yourself some consistency. Um, if you can major on like the same location, the same time of day, if you're going to do da a daily prayer time, that's just so much easier for you to stick to, especially in the beginning, um, than trying to like do it at different times in different ways and you know experience all these different things like just try and stay consistent it's going to be more helpful for you practically and then finally and this can sound a little counterintuitive given the last one but you want to give yourself a little bit of variety like once you've had that consistency once you find yourself being consistent occasionally I would say block out maybe a little more time than you're used to every once in a while maybe uh, go to a different place. Um, than you normally go to, just because that kind of variety can help keep you engaged. And we do that in our other relationships too. We don't always go to the same place at the same time, though we do have a lot of consistency in our closest relationships. Occasionally we do things a little uh, out of the ordinary 
and we find value in that. So I'd encourage you, be realistic, give yourself room, be consistent, and occasionally put some variety in there. Is there anything to be said about the fact that if you don't really plan out your life at all, this is really hard to do. <laughs> like, I mean, the, it, not just prayer, but yeah, like yeah. other aspects of life. If there's not thinking or intentionality about how you spend your time, it makes it really hard to intentionally spend your time with prayer or any other spiritual practice or discipline. Absolutely. Uh, you, you need to have some, you don't need to be type A and have every 15 minutes accounted for. Scott. <laughs> but, but there there are plenty of type B people who have deep relationships, and therefore you know what it takes totally. to maintain those, and that's what we're asking Sometimes for. Sometimes deeper than us type A people, <laughs> to be honest. But that's what we're asking for, and I think that's what, um, if the reason we're doing this is not to get something done, but to flourish in a relationship with God. Mm. And so if you're after a deep relationship with him, you kind of know already what it looks like to maintain that. You're going to need to do something like that if you want to maintain it with God himself. That's so good. All right, so... We have a sense then of how to figure out when we pray, but I think one of the things that, that seems hard for people is that they're ta- in their times of prayer, when they're praying, they, they aren't what they expect them to be, right? So, okay, I've carved out my 10 minutes, or I've carved out my 30 minutes, or I've called, carved whatever it is, like I've, I've carved out this time, and then I've done it. And it's really disappointing, right? It's, it's not what I expected it to be. And not only today, but like it wasn't expe- what I expected it to be yesterday or the day before that either. I, how, how do we deal with that? I think that's the biggest, probably the, the single biggest issue um, when it comes to maintaining a devotional life is the issue of managing your expectations. Because I think we just have a lot of false assumptions, not just around how long or how, you know, how many days in a row, but around what it's supposed to be like. And I think one of the illustrations I've used in the past is if you imagine like you're going to start going to the gym and the expectation you have is that A, you'll always be excited to go. You'll always be excited to work out. You'll never miss a day. And every day you're going to see progress in the mirror. So Monday you go, Tuesday you're going to see something in the mirror. And what if you approach going to the gym that way, you would be really disappointed and you'd be really demotivated and tempted to quit Mm -hmm. because you'd be like, it's not working. It's not what I wanted it to be. But the truth is, it's working exactly like it's supposed to work, but your expectations were wrong, and so you got really frustrated. Um, And in the same way, like, people go, I'm going to have a more thorough and flourishing prayer life. And so they expect, I'm always going to be excited to pray, I'm never going to miss a day, and every day is going to be better than the last. And if you go in with that, you're just asking to be frustrated and demotivated and maybe stop praying altogether. Hmm. And so that's why these expectations are really, really important to go through. Okay, so, so let's let's unpack that a little bit. Um, what are some of the issues that we tend to have with expectations? Yeah, the first one I would say is is experience. We have expectations for a certain kind of experience that we're going to have, um, and we end up chasing like an experience in our devotional life, in reading and meditation and prayer, instead of looking for God Himself. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, like any deep relationship, um, your focus in that relationship is supposed to be on the person, not on the experience that person gives you. If you focus on that experience, really the relationship's going to wither. Um, and, and so what we're doing in prayer is a lot of times our expectation is I'm going to go and have this great experience. But what we're after is God, not the experience of God uh, in a very selfish way. And that you see that at work in your other relationships. Like any relationship with another person will like feel differently at different times. Sometimes it'll be really striking and sometimes it'll be really like routine. And in the context of a long-term, like deep relationship, those feelings are both expected and kind of embraced as part of the intimacy. You're supposed to have some mundane times as well as some striking times with someone you're that close to for that long. And so in the same way, like time with God that doesn't like leave your face glowing, you know, when you're done is actually a way you can tell you're close to him. And so what we need to do is adjust our expectations to match a long-term relationship with God that's going to ebb and flow in experience mm. without losing sight of the fact that when we're with God, we should enjoy that. Mm. And so, and so that, that's not just to say that, the, that there won't be these incredible experiences with God and these times of closeness, but it's also 
to say that those can't be scheduled. <laughs> they can't be scheduled, and, and sometimes the mundane ones are the beautiful ones. Mm, you know, yeah, and like any relationship, yeah. sometimes just being around the same way you've been for a lot of days in the past, there's something really, really wonderful to that aspect of a close relationship. Mm, mm, yeah, we the, see mundane as negative, right? When, when the reality is, it's really deeply part of of intimacy and in, in those relationships. Yeah, that right. leads me to the the next expectation. Um, that sometimes can mess us up in this regard is an expectation for consistency. We have this kind of uh, mentality sometimes when it comes to uh, our consistency that we're not going to miss a day. We're never going to miss a day ever in our prayer. Like we set these high expectations and say, I'm always going to every day, wake up every day, every single day, every single day. And then when you have that mentality and then you miss a day, you can easily become deflated. Um, You can easily become... Uh, demoralized and and your motivation is taken out from you that, oh, I've missed a day, forget it all, I've lost it all, just give up completely. Um, when the reality is you're human and you're going to make um, mistakes when it comes to your planning, you're going to make errors when it comes to your schedule, you're going to over schedule yourself some weeks, you're going to um, you're going to uh, miss out on certain things at different points. And this isn't to say that, oh, yeah, skip prayer whenever you want. It's not a priority. That's not what I'm saying. But if you have this intense expectation of consistency that says you miss one and you've missed them all, you've misunderstood what the relationship with God is supposed to be. Um, you're going to understand, you have to understand you're going to miss a prayer, uh, a time of prayer um, uh, every once in a while. Don't let that deflate you. Keep fighting through. And, and I think a helpful way to think of it is a relationship with God is not a, a, a series of, of you know battles, each one you have to win that if you want to go on. It's more like a war. I'm not that you're fighting, but more like a war. It's a longer term um, relational uh, 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 depth that you're aiming for in prayer. Okay. That's good. All right. So, so we've got... Um we have expectations regarding our experience, what that's going to be like. We have expectations regarding our consistency. Uh, what else? I think attitude is a big one. I think a lot of people, well, the truth of the matter is like we should wake up every day excited to spend time with God and keep him at the very center of our lives every moment of every day. That should be true, but we don't. Um, and, and the reason is very clear, like, because there's remaining sin in our hearts, and that's going to fight our desire for holiness and intimacy with God and obedience. And yet we tend to come in with expectations that we should want to pray every day with, like, increasing excitement. Every day should be, we should want more than the last. And if you think that way, you're going to set yourself up for a lot of confusion, because what's interesting is the Bible would actually tell you, if you read the Bible, it's going to tell you that living the Christian life is going to be more of a struggle than you expect it to be if you have that expectation for your prayer life. And so many people get discouraged when they're praying because they think someone with like a real faith would be more excited to pray. And maybe I'm just not cut out for prayer. And maybe I'm just not that kind of person that's going to want to do that. But the truth is that if you struggle to pray, if you struggle to want to pray, that actually proves you're on the right track. That proves that you're a human being who's being made more into the image of Jesus Christ and are struggling to to continue in that relationship. And so if you can adjust your expectations to match what God's word actually says about who you are uh, and and the attitude you're probably going to have given that sin in your heart, you're going to find yourself on the right track when you find yourself struggling to want to pray. I think one of the other expectations that we deal with is actually maybe a, a failure to change expectations when life changes, um, right? We, we have an, an assumption that, that prayer should always be X or, or it all, should always look like X, but we don't account for the fact that life's no, never that consistent, right? Life is a, a journey and we go through different seasons in life and different um, things we're facing sometimes that, sometimes that help prayer and make it easier and sometimes that make prayer more difficult, um, that even make it practically and logistically more difficult. Um, because prayer is going to look different when you're a college student than when you're a stay-at-home parent. Um, and, and actually, I think one of the, the difficulties, particularly of prayer, is when we remember previous times of prayer we had, right? And, and we think that what faithfulness looks like is recapturing what we used to do. Right, recapturing how we used to pray when we were in our twenties, or recapturing what we used to, what prayer used to look like when we were in our fifties, or the good old days. Yeah, yeah. Like we're, we're and, and so we're we're haunted by this expectation um, that doesn't 
change and flow with the, the changes in life. And actually, I think that the, those changes, um, we assume that they're, they're always negative, right? I mean, sometimes the changing seasons in life allow us to, to engage in prayer differently um, in ways that, that actually take us deeper, that actually um, are, are even richer, um, but they're not what they used to be or they're not what we assume they should be. And so we, we don't uh, account for that. Um, I mean, the reality is sometimes when we find ourselves praying less or praying differently than we used to, we, we need to repent, right? Sometimes that's true. But sometimes the wise course of action is to adjust our expectations instead, right? If you're sick or if you're otherwise limited in a way that you, you didn't used to be, don't expect that your prayer life should look exactly the way it did before. But, but simply ask, what does faithfulness look like now? And, and actually, maybe, maybe more deeply and more to the point that we keep coming back to, what does a rich relationship with God look like now? Right. How can I relate to God from where I am and uh, communicate to him, cry out to him, um, speak to him from where I am now? What, is, what should that look like instead of trying to recreate what it, what it used to look like or what it looked like during a, a different season? Yeah, you put all these together. And the reason we're talking about this is not to like make you listeners uh, like pessimists about prayer. Like The, the answer isn't like just we'll just lower your expectation like that's not what we're trying to do what we're trying to do is understand the reality that we're in the reality that we're human that we're still sinners um and that there's going to be struggles and so the answer isn't we'll just lower your expectations because of those things the answer is when you deal with these results essentially of the fall when you deal with these results of the fact that we can't control the seasons of our life and our attitude is often poor and a lot of times we are inconsistent like what you do is you take those to the gospel. I think that's really the answer here is not to lower your expectations, but to turn to the gospel. And so when you have avoided intimacy with God, when you have had a, uh, when you walk in with a poor attitude, when you have been, you know, inconsistent, um, when, when a season in life changes and you're just frustrated with that or not sure how to handle it, the answer is, well, Jesus died for you knowing that you'd go through that season, knowing that you'd have a bad attitude, knowing that you'd, you know, be that inconsistent. And, and turn to him and say, "Hey, that wasn't great." You know, like, yeah, and, and yeah. be able to know this is you know, encountering that kind of love. If that's what you do with your new expectations, is it let them drive you to God, not take you away from Him? Mm. Then you find yourself uh, being drawn back to prayer, drawn back to wanting to commune with a God who would be that forgiving and who would be that relationally connected to you. That even this person you are um, is the one that He wants to be with. All right, so we've got time set aside, and we've tried to deal with our expectations. Um, right, when we come to prayer, right, sitting down to pray and talk to and write to God, um, what do we do now? Well, yeah, when you're talking about your devotional time as a whole, kind of the, the first thing you're going to need to do now that you've scheduled time and dealt with some of these expectations is figure out what you're going to read. Um, and for a lot of people, um, that's a real challenge because they feel overwhelmed with the Bible. Um, or, or oftentimes what they'll do is they'll, they'll say, they'll take off a really big like Bible reading plan, you know, cause it's January 1st and you got to have a new one. And then like, there's some inconsistency there and that can fall away because you just had all this stuff you wanted to do. What I think you need to, to understand when you're trying to figure out what to read, um, you need to do, know two things. You need to know both what you're going to read that day and why you're going to read it. And if you have that, you're basically good. Oftentimes, the reason why Bible reading plans can fail you or they, they aren't motivating enough for you is because you know what you're going to read, but you don't know why you're going to read it. And so if you, there's several ways you can, you can kind of look at this. Um, you can get a lot of Bible reading plans online. Uh, in the notes, there are links to Bible reading plans you can choose from. But you can also create your own plan. Um, that can last for a week, it can last for a month, it can last for several years. But the idea is that you know what you're going to read and why you're going to read it. So for example, if you want to read through the Bible in a year, you want to have an answer to the question, why do I want to do that? Why is that something that a way that I want to hear from God? Or if you, you maybe a personal plan, I want to read Galatians 10 times in a row, because I want to know what that book has to say. And I think doing it a bunch of times is going to help me listen better. Like those, those are two very different plans. But they both have the key elements of, you know, what you're going to read that day and you know why you're going to do it. 
And so over the long haul, sort of whatever plan you choose, if you have those two things in mind, what you're looking for is sort of a steady, well-rounded diet of Bible intake. I like the, the uh, illustration of like having a well-rounded diet. So throughout a year or throughout your life, you're going to want to not just have really large meals where you're reading several chapters in a row. You're also going to want to have some small meals where you're taking a few verses and kind of savoring them and being more meditative with them. You know, and so you find yourself sort of uh, have been well-rounded in what you're choosing to read. And that can help you inform, help inform you as to why you're choosing to read certain things versus others. Okay, so we've carved out time. Right, we sit down to spend time with God, and so we spend some time reading. We're we're probably doing some meditation, right, in the midst of that, and, and and bridging that gap to to prayer. We're praying, maybe even praying some of the different types of prayer that we talked about in in our last session. We're we're trying to take time to adore Him, to confess our sin, to thank Him, to lament, to um, make requests. Um, but I think all of that, right, even when you sit down just, just for one time, whether it's 30 minutes or even it's just 10 minutes, like, it, it can be really overwhelming. How, how do we figure out what to pray when there's so many options? Like, like do we go through the same thing over and over again? Like, like how, do we, how do we figure out where, where to start? How do we figure out what to include any, on any given devotional time? I think the first thing to to remember is that um, your prayer life, uh, your reading and your prayer, uh, you're not necessarily trying to squeeze every possible kind of prayer you can pray into one time. The um, the relationships we talked about last session are a little more complicated than that. Some seasons are going to be heavier in certain types and others in other types. Some seasons you might be at capacity so much, you're sick, someone you love is sick, that getting your Bible open at all is is a win. That's prioritizing Bible and prayer in that season of your life. And so you want to make sure you don't sort of have that assumption that I'm supposed to be doing everything I possibly can every time I pray. And, and one of the best ways I've found um, to, to generate prayer, to sort of guide what I'm going to do, instead of me sort of sitting down and trying to allocate time to different things, I've found that uh, biblical meditation, like we talked about a few sessions ago, is a great way to generate uh, prayer to generate what you're going to pray for. In fact, um, William Bridge, who's an old uh, a Christian from uh, a few hundred years ago, he says uh, meditation is the sister of reading and it's the mother of prayer. He says even though your heart can be indisposed or not inclined to prayer, if that person can fall into a meditation of God and the things of God and the scripture of God, your heart will soon come off to prayer. In other words, when you meditate on God's word, um, it gives birth in some ways to prayer requests. And so instead of, for me, a lot of times, instead of trying to conjure up reasons to praise God or conjure up things to confess or reasons to give thanks or stuff to ask for, I tend to, to go to the Bible I'm reading and in meditation, let God himself kind of open up my heart to things to pray for. And so, for example, just to get it more practical, if you're in like Ephesians 2, and you get to verses 8 through 10, you know, and you're meditating. So it's, you know, for by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of work so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. If you're meditating on that, at some level you're doing your preparation, your observation, your interpretation. So you know what the passage is, is saying. And there's ways you go, well, how does this lead me to adore God? And you go, oh, I have, I have some great ways to adore God out of this. And meditating kind of generates those. There's ways you can confess. There's ways you can give thanks. There's even plenty of ways to find requests. As you think about the different people in your life or think about your own life, like what are some of these good works? I can look around and go, God prepared some of these beforehand. I want to pray that people would walk in them because of the grace of God. Like all of a sudden, you're not sort of in this vacuum creating things out of nowhere. God speaks and you're responding in prayer as he guides you in meditation. Yeah, and I think that... um that meditation often can produce uh, uh, these kinds of prayer that we've talked about, right? This adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and uh, lament and supplication. And I think it brings up kind of the question of what are the biblical priorities for asking for things, for the category of supplication? What are those priorities and and what, uh, what kind of principles guide us? And the Bible does give us some general priorities that do guide our requests, what kinds of things we should be requesting. Um, and, I, and I have them kind of in four different categories. You could think of it as there's kingdom prayer, which is requests that we pray asking for God's kingdom to come to earth. 
praying for spiritual revival, praying for God to raise up leaders to reach out and um, and do the work for the kingdom of God, praying for even Jesus's return is a, a request, a supplication that can be made. Um, the second category is more global prayer, requests for people who are maybe removed from you geographically, um, government leaders praying for other nations, praying for persecuted believers, praying for missionaries or churches that are abroad. The third category would be local prayer, which would be requests for people who are in your city or in your immediate surrounding in a lot of ways, prayer that God would bless and reveal himself in the city of Los Angeles, in your city, Culver City, Santa Monica, wherever you are, um, praying for the weak and the needy, the marginalized, the hurt in the hurting in your city, praying for even other local churches and ministries that are a part of your city, reaching out to the city that you um, live in. And then the fourth category, we've done kingdom, global, local prayer. And the fourth category is personal prayer. Um, there's a place for personal prayer, praying, making requests for yourself and for those who are close to you in your life, praying for your own needs, praying for your own heart and your own maybe desires, praying for God um, to do things for you that you long for him to do, um, uh, praying for loved ones, family and friends, praying for your church community, praying for sick people that you know, praying for non-believers that you know. All of these are categories that I think are um, priorities for our supplication, our request making uh, when it comes to God. Kingdom prayer, global prayer, local prayer, and personal prayer. And I think what's cool about that is if you if you think about it, what you have is maybe your specific reading for the day is generating prayer as you meditate on it. But then these priorities are basically the whole Bible generating prayer. And so the idea isn't that you'd go through all of those, you know, every time you pray, but like some, some of us listening, like you might've like never prayed like a kingdom prayer. And you're like, oh, that's just a whole category the Bible drives me towards. I should like think about that and try and include that. You might've never prayed like a local prayer. Maybe all you do is personal prayer. All you do is local prayer. These are really cool ways that the whole Bible drives you and informs the different ways you should be praying. Okay, so uh, man, that, that's incredibly helpful. And at the same time, I think also incredibly overwhelming, <laughs> right? I mean, if, if somebody's listening to this while they're driving, they're like, I, 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 I don't know how to keep all this straight, <laughs> right? Like th those are all sound totally important and awesome. Um, so h how do we keep this organized? I mean, I mean, should we keep track of this? Like, should we like write this down? Should we utilize either these categories or something like them um, and, and, and keep track, maybe have a, a prayer list or something like that? Um, or is that too formal? Um, is that too, too, too potentially stilted? Uh, or, or do you find that helpful? I don't, what do you think? You know, we have a, uh, a book we recommend a lot called A Praying Life. And a guy named Paul Miller wrote that. And he goes around uh, and teaches on the practice of prayer for people. And one of the things he does a lot is he'll ask everyone in the room, like, hey, do you have any kind of system to keep track of your schedule? Like, where you're supposed to be when? Like, any any kind. And, like, everyone's hand goes up. Because even if you're really type B, you have some way of knowing, like, where you need to be when. When you make an appointment with someone or you've got a class or you got to get to work. Like, you have some sense of that. And he says, like, all these hands go up. And then he says, so how many of you have a system to keep track of your prayer requests? And he's like, almost all of them go down. And his his response is, like, this is because we think keeping our appointments uh, with people is more important than praying for people. Like, we think that that keeping our schedule and not missing somewhere we're supposed to be is more important than uh, than making sure we pray for somebody. And he would say that's not true. And I think uh, we sometimes theoretically understand that, but maybe we haven't understood it in our heart as much as we should in a way that would drive us to actually keep track of who we pray for. So there's tons of times when, as a Christian, you talk to somebody and you either think, wow, I should be praying for them, or you tell them, like, I will be praying for you. And a lot of times, I think a lot of people don't actually follow through on that. Um, or they remember, like, two weeks later, and like, oh, I should have been praying for this thing, and, and I forgot. And I think that's, it's very, very genuine. It's not insincere to say, I care enough about this person. I care enough about God. I care about enough, enough about this concern that I want to keep track of it and write it down and make sure that I remember to care in prayer. And so I think it's, it's, it's an amazing help in keeping your prayer life actually vibrant and exciting. I think it's actually demotivating to not have a prayer list because you end up getting repetitive. You forget a lot of things. It can become a lot more difficult. So keeping track of your prayer is a way of really expressing sincerity and getting that vibrancy in your prayer life. And I think it's so helpful because it, it's not disingenuous or formal to 
put uh, a time that you're going to meet up with somebody on your calendar, right? That helps to facilitate your love, helps to make, make sure um, that it's there, or, or even to even just to scratch down on a piece of paper, right? The reminder. Yeah. Um, uh, and so it, obviously that applies to our, our prayer life as well. And there's a danger too. I mean, there, there's a danger of working like more on your prayer system than you're praying, but I just don't think that's a danger a lot of people face. I've done it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's very rare. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a rare thing. No, but, see, but, 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 yeah, but it's, it's a real thing. Like, I think it's a really, like, like, like the, I think that the, sometimes it can be easier to think through the system and to work on the system and to think through like what kind of what you, I think it's easier to dream about what you would like your prayer to be like than it is to actually just engage in the prayer. So whether that manifests in a system or even just in your own thoughts about it, I think there is a temptation where it's easier to think about prayer than it is to even just stop and take the time and do it. Absolutely. And that's why any, any list, you, any way of keeping track of, of prayers you want to pray, you just always want, the, the evaluative criteria is, is this helping me pray? Hmm. So not having a system typically does not help you pray. Working too much in your system does not help you pray. And so that's really the thing you want to ask. And for a lot of people, you'll get questions on like, so what, what does that look like? What kind of system is there? And there's a lot of different ways to do this. I mean, it's, it can be as simple as I'm just going to keep an index card with me. And when I think of something I'm supposed to be praying for, I'm going to write it down on that index card and then pull that out when I pray. That's a great place to start. But there's also other systems. I know um, uh, Don Carson is a New Testament scholar, and he uh, says that he basically has promised the students he teaches and missionaries that he's been in contact with, I will pray for you. If you send me like letters, um, I'll pray for those. And he just has a manila folder that he just carries around. And every time he gets a letter, he swaps out the old one and he organizes them in like alphabetical order by the person. So when he's praying, he just goes through some people for that day, puts them in, you know, they're now in the back of the list. And the next day, he picks up where he left off. And that's a way of praying. It helps him pray, he says. Paul Miller in A Praying Life talks about index cards and kind of having an index card for each person that you care about and each concern you want to pray for. So you can write a scripture on it or even like have itemized like things you're praying for so that you can like write down a date when that prayer got answered, which is such a great way to look and be encouraged. Like God listens to your prayers and not having a list, sometimes you don't get to see that. So that's a great way to do it. Uh, I tend to use uh, an electronic system. I use a program called Evernote. Um, which is on my phone and my computer, um, and it sort of syncs up. And so I have sort of like an index card, a note for a lot of the people in my life, a lot of the concerns, and you can like tag them and break them down. And if you're sort of someone that likes to work with organizational schemes, that can, that can be a place that's really helpful for you because I have one for like daily prayer and then one for weekly prayer, one for letters from missionaries, things like that. Um, but there's lots of different ways to do this. The question is, what can you do that will help you pray? Yeah, and I think there's, I, I mean, Evernote, is probably very useful. I use something called Prayer Mate, um, which is another system that you basically what you have is it's an app on your phone and you have categories and you fill in the prayer requests that you get and you can add them instantaneously. They're very easy to add to different categories. So if you have a category like kingdom prayer, global prayer, local prayer, personal prayer, and then you open up the app and you start the and it gives you one random one, I guess, uh, one of the requests from um, that category. So you're praying for a variety of categories in a time of prayer, and you can keep adding requests. You can add um, notes to the requests. You can have um, things that you, yeah, it just helps organize it in some way. And that's another simple way that, that would be electronic as well. Yeah, another app I've utilized is Echo Prayer. Um, which similarly has been helpful. I mean, it's it's fascinating. I mean, I feel like even over the time of my my prayer life, like I I tend to like vacillate between different systems during different seasons mm -hmm. and times. You know, whether it's like u utilizing Echo Prayer, I've utilized that for a while. Um, and there have been times where index cards were more helpful, right? Um, something written in a journal. Um, but I think. Switch and, and I think that's helpful too. Is like switching formats or even ways or even how you're you're keeping track of things isn't like I think sometimes it feels like failure, hmm. right? Like oh that didn't work, like it didn't take, like that wasn't the silver bullet that solved my prayer life forever, <laughs> right? Which is kind of what we're looking for. Um, but but really we're just asking like, does this help my prayer now? 
right? It did, is this helping me to pray and to relate to God mm-hmm. now? And, and to the extent that it is doing that, it can serve that, 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 purpose for maybe a short amount of time, maybe for a long amount of time. You know, maybe it is a system that you adopt for, for decades and decades and become something that you um, neatly hone. Um, but I think regardless, I think the, the point's well taken that one way or another, um, to be faithfully praying for just all, all the different things around our lives, that keeping track of it one way or another has to be a part of that. Yeah, because ultimately, it's whatever helps you pray. If a switching system is going to help you pray, then switch the system. It, 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 there's not a, a one right way to do this so long as it's helping you pray. Because in this whole time, this whole session, we've been talking about a lot of practicalities. It, it's been, I think, pretty practical. But we, I hope you listening and we in the room we no, never lose sight that these practicalities are really just about speaking and relating to God. It's still a very relational dynamic. And just because we're getting practical doesn't mean we're not talking anymore about knowing God in a relational sense, because this is what it looks like to care enough about a relationship, to value a relationship enough that you plan to, to make it a reality in your life and a constant reality in your life. And so it's out of like scheduling and experiencing the times together with someone else that you get to know someone more deeply. And that's what we're after with God. We want to speak to and relate to God. And so hopefully what this session has done is allowed people to understand, here's what it looks like to value it so much, I actually want to plan. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful, but I'm unsure exactly how helpful these sessions are going to be for everybody <laughs> listening. I think that it'll be really helpful, but I'm sure. I know... <laughs> I know for me, these, this has been super helpful. Yeah. I, I mean, I think uh, similarly to um, a few sessions ago where I just I walked out just with a burning desire to engage deeper in his word. Um, I know that I'm leaving our time together today um, just with a burning desire to relate to him more, to talk to him more, to talk to him more completely, to talk to him in, in, in more diverse ways and to maybe identify some of the ways that I tend not to, um, or the ways that I, um, that, that, that laziness or roteness slips in, uh, to my prayer. And, um, yeah, and I'm, I, I'm encouraged and, and spurred on. So I want to thank you guys for that. And, um, I'm excited to see what he's going to continue to do as we wrap up, uh, this prayer prayer category in the next next session. So we've been talking about walking with God, about knowing him deeply throughout all of our lives. And that means obviously speaking to and relating to him in prayer. We've in this session, we've talked about where to put prayer in your schedule, about how to handle your various expectations, and about how to figure out what to do when you're praying, practically when you're praying. And so here just, I mean, We've been very practical, and, and so in, in that vein, I want to leave you with a couple of practical questions to consider as we go on from this session. The first is, what expectations do you need to adjust when it comes to your prayer life, right? And inevitably, there are going to be some expectations that you, you've been carrying with you that maybe our conversation today has, has brought up. What expectations do you now recognize need to be adjusted in, in your relating to God? And, and secondly, how practically can you be more intentional when it comes to spending time in prayer? And, and maybe just even just answer that question. I would encourage you to answer that question with even just one, just one simple answer. What is one way you can be more intentional in prayer? Is it scheduling? Is it starting a prayer list? Is it um, updating your prayer list? Like what, what's one thing you can do uh, to be more intentional in spending time with prayer? And uh, with that, we will wrap up our, our category of prayer in our eighth session next time.